Dimitri is working on a lot of stuff. Uh, whether it is uh, Big Chain DB as a founding member, uh, the Ocean Protocol, or um, Interledger, <laughs> all kinds of interplanetary stuff. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's an honor to uh, to have uh, the closing keynote from uh, Dimitri de Jonge, um, uh, actually from uh, from Belgium. So actually uh, from Belgium. Uh, Belgium. So uh, actually uh, from Belgium. Um, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Dimitri, take it away. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Manage expectations. Uh, uh, let me fall with the door in the house, as the Dutch say. Uh, so my name is Dimitri de Jonge. I'm a blockchain application director, which is quite bad. Um, I have a m manager who's a bad man. Um, if I had an assistant, it would be badass. Um, but for Ocean Protocol, a different project, I call myself the Decentralized Innovation Maker. Um, I like Delft because they have a Decentrale, uh, <laughs> which is something I just caught up. Um, my talk today will be more in the line of what Johan just was broadcasting. Uh, I, I really love your stuff, so I thought, well, I should mention it. Uh, it's about public utility networks and how to enable them. So let's see. We are screwed. Um, and that's mainly because we're farmed. We're humans and we're getting farmed by data. So if you go to a service, you enter in the service and then they start milking your data. And they use it, and they put a big moat around it, and they use it for machine learning, for advertisement, bidding markets, whatever they can figure out about your buying behavior. And then they anticipate on that, and then you give them money in the end. And we have no control. And big powers are currently the ones that have big data, a lot of big data. Google, Uber, Facebook, those are the online ones. Uh, but you'll see this also popping up in autonomous driving, in anything related to ERP, whatnot. I was very inspired by JP. Hi, JP. Uh, what he was telling me about the tragedy of commons, and it's actually something that we tend to do. We are quite fueled by self-interest. Our reward function in our brain wants to get resource. And then we consume all resource, and then the common resource is gone. So that's what the tragedy of a common is. I s look, Googled it, and there was a lot of cows. So cows are bad. <laughs> so something I call the digital me, or the dimi, um, it's kind of worth a buck. Why? How does this work? Well, it's simple. I put a honeypot, an app. I guess I have a few honeypots in my pocket. Um, use my amazing phone, and then I create a digital copy of myself onto their servers. And then they go and say, hold all this data together, make something like macroeconomics. It allows me to create an advertisement market. It, it allows me to connect the consumer and the producer, be in the middle of the market, and have a very powerful uh, position. So for us, it's yeah, we have that little honeypot, and that's nice. Uh, but it's actually a wrong mentality. So there's a little, uh, you can read it. Roses are red, violets are blue, which silo and moat the service reads you. And shows you ads for flower shops and tracks your clicks and never stops. It cares not that privacy is harmed. Money is green, so people are farmed. Twitter is sign, Facebook is blue, your friends are the product, as so as you. <laughs> so I guess that what, that's what blockchangers should be doing, no? Reach common goals, common objectives, create a legion, uh, and then be anti-fragile, meaning that if the legion fails, still create a legion. Uh, <laughs> Self-sustaining uh, self -sustaining is important. You can bootstrap it and it will grow. Um, it's, yeah, interesting stuff. So what if we create decentralized communities, not economies, from 
pooling resources, not siloing them. And this piggybacks very well on the work of Johan and in Delft. These guys figured it out, so why can't we? <laughs> um, what happens is that basically you create something that's decentralized and it requires some resource. And that resource is hashing power. How boring. Hashing power. So we're reaching what now? Um, a lot of it. Does anybody know it's Terra, Beta, Exa? Exa? Exa. Exa. So um, who's the winner? The, as with every gold rush, the mining equipment, the infrastructure. Bitcoin. Is it a cash system? Is anybody using Bitcoin for cash? I know nobody has Bitcoins. But, uh, but if I would have them, I would hollow. I would keep them uh, as a gold store. Now, Ethereum, version 2.0, smart contracts. Uh, and we've seen this evolution. I've seen this in other talks. They'll say currency, smart contracts, business logic, and then, and then trust. I hear trust. Uh, I, might be, might be the one. Uh, maybe you have another one. Let's see. Uh, but it's all the same. Ethereum, the world computer, creates a substrate for people to create communities with their own economies, maybe. So all of these apps might just use Ethereum out of the box. It's an API. It's out there. Um, it's a network. It's self-sustaining. So Ethereum for the public world is quite interesting. Now. Bitcoin, be your own bank, but tends to be a value for ego, a store for ego. Ethereum, tokenized networks, uh, I should replace this and do something with kitties. Uh, but actually, the, the, that's the good story, the kitties. The, the, the bad story is actually an ICO launch platform. It's something to create securities and not utilities. Now, what they should be doing is consume a lot of energy, so secure the network. Bitcoin would validate transactions, and Ethereum would validate business logic, compute. And then you have this slight benefit. If you're really into the community, you might have a lot of stake or a lot of GitHub commits, and they can even propose some changes. And then you're engaged in a protocol. Your change can be perceived as an attack. Now, when Filecoin, and there is a lot of uh, reason to, to think Filecoin might be a bit overhyped. But there is also a good reason to think why Filecoin enables something new. And I must say, Johan also has been doing similar stuff, but for me it boils down to creating a market where for a public utility, something we can use all, storage, create a market so gigantic that the marginal cost of the infrastructure drops. So we can use that. And the only thing we have to do now to steer away from the tragedy of a commons is to decentralize the reward function. Have not a central policy maker that gives away the reward. Go into, I don't know how that part of my brain looks like. Um, but if we can connect this to an objective function of the common goals, then we might be shifting uh, the gears a little bit. That's what we call public utility networks. Has anyone heard about this term, public utility networks, or am I just introducing this? A few, so, okay. Uh, no copyrights for me. Um, public, permissionless, and rent-free. Everybody can join, and a token is an incentive, it's a reward system. You can use a token to use the utility. You can earn token by providing the utility. And sometimes you can also exchange and speculate. Um, utility, very important, has to be useful for the public. And if you can prove that you did it, prove that you did that hashing power, prove that you did that bandwidth, uh, prove that you did that storage, then might happen that the marginal cost of that product goes down. 
and it has to be a network because it has to be self-sustaining. But this also means that the vision needs to be co-owned. We all have to agree on that common goal. And all the building blocks as well. It has to be open source. Here are a few that I'm very excited about. This is where I want to spend uh, one or a few years. Uh, prediction markets creating gigantic pools of knowledge. Decentralized compute, high performance compute outsourced to an off chain network that gets rewarded by on chain. Data and IoT markets, Ocean Protocol is one. Data broker DAO and IOTA doing focusing really on that IoT data, make it available to the, to the network. And what we get is these things pools. So I'm very excited to create very big pools of knowledge with incentive functions. How does this work? Well, a bit of carrot and a stick. Um, but provide some resource utility, prove it cryptographically that you actually did it. And then go to the block reward function and get a token, and then use that token to consume a resource. So we had hashing power, transactions, business logic. We have some compute already, storage. Uh, there I see a few knowledge pooling, uh, things like um, proof of authority, uh, but there's also a lot of about privacy, a fully decentralized store, uh, AI, ML, making sure that machine learning can be outsourced, but if you have a lot of data but don't know how to consolidate it. Uh, existence, prove that you exist, prove that a device exists. Uh, identity, prove that you've destroyed something. I'm very good at that. Um, roaming, bandwidth. Um, so there's so much out there. Now, with BigchainDB, we mainly started with the data angle because we think data might be important as well. And what happens if you decentralize data? Well, these scenarios, I, this was, oh, I, I was on Slack and I, I, I want to read my, my messages and they just told me that my messages, I need to pay for my data. I, I, I thought, wow, Kafka. Uh, but another thing that ha happens is I, I went then to Chrome settings for some reason. Uh, I saw, oh, they're storing all my passwords. And oh, that's a lot of passwords. Uh, so we create a login for almost every service we use. And then we sometimes reuse some of those logins. And then some of those services aren't fully secured. So that's where you go in as a hacker. And you put your hacker hat on, go to the, uh, what is it, the soccer match thingy, something that admin admin will solve, and then get all the plain text passwords and move on, move your way up. And we just do that. <laughs> we just make passwords. Uh, something that got me excited in the beginning, uh, in 2013 when we started Ascribe, was all about ownership of creativity. Uh, intellectual property. And so Ascribe was a service to put that ownership onto a blockchain such that you can track the provenance, who owned it before you, who was the actual creator, and then create royalty schemas or any kind of valuation. Now, there is this trend going to self-sovereignty. Eh? You are in control of your assets. Um, for data, that's data self-sovereignty. You can see stuff like self-sovereign identities and so on. But it needs a trust substrate. It needs something where you can put publicly verifiable claims. Something that people can look at and say, oh, this is true. Or say that, hmm, that's not true. Everybody could, should be able to read the claim, but not necessarily know the exact data that yielded the claim. So, Combining ownership and blockchain gives you self-sovereignty, just one path forward. And the blockchain we love to use is IPDB, the Interplanetary Database for the Commons. It's probably the second foundation in Berlin now, eh? but then just one week after. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so it's managed by, 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 by caretakers. Uh, we're moving to a Tendermint BFT setup. Uh, now we have uh, proof of authority. Um, and it's the, the authority that currently manages this database for the commons, that's actually things like Internet Archive, Dyn.org, Unmonastery. These are all institutions that care about future decentralization of the Internet. Um, the underlying technology underneath that 
governance layer is uh, BigchainDB, which is, you could say, the MongoDB of the blockchain or a, a decentralized database with Tendermint, but you could also say a blockchain database, whatever. Um, the go goal is take big data, make it trustworthy in a trustless environment. And there's a lot of things you can do with it. You all know these uh, words. So, um, what I want to do with this as an app guy, uh, well, at least somebody that has to eat his own dog food and, and say, uh, well, we built this now, what can we do with it? So, one of the things we're doing with it is bringing your app data to the app rather than having the app hosting your data. So, you go to this website. Oh, this is even my. I need this for later. Um, you go to, to, to a website and you bring your data along, and maybe if everybody else can do that, then we create a network. And you're basically creating a gateway where you're not actually having the app to, uh, you're actually giving the permissions for the app. You're giving the claims. You're using the blockchain as an access control layer which can help in settings like GDPR, where you have to prove that you opt in or opt out, where you have the right to be forgotten, you just remove the access, all of that. So for this, we have a whole bunch of tools, middleware layers, APIs, uh, for the hackathon might be helpful if you want to play around with it. Another cool thing, and that's why I needed these guys, are, are digital twins. So these are typically based on tags. We also have secure QR codes. And this is more or less a, a little Visa card, uh, NFC chip. And then you have a little app. Do I have the app? Um, it's called The Twin of Things. It's in collaboration with Inogy. And there's some people there. So Twin of Things app. Just a little scanner. Scan the NFC tag. Live demo. Oh, successful. Then I'll show it. Um, so it reads out the public key of this tag. It goes to IPFS, the interplanetary file system. It goes to IPDB, fetches all the data. It sends a challenge response to this chip. The chip signs off, and this communication, this interaction also has been stored and added to the life cycle of that whatever product is attached to this chip. So I, we could also see if we can provide some chips for the hackathon as well. So creating a digit, digital twin has amazing amount of properties. Huh? Everything has its life cycle. It's a building block of machine identity for a machine economy. And well, we're just one piece of the puzzle with BigchainDB. We work with IOTA for uh, device authentication. We work with IPFS for, for image storage and bigger PDFs and, and all of that. BigchainDB is a query layer. Um, th th there's a lot of vendors that do, do the hardware, create chips, uh, secure QR codes, uh, all of that. So you really create an architecture and try to use best of breed for everything. Now, one step further is looking at our data economy itself. And if you could say if you have more data, you probably can hit more accuracy and get more money out of your service. So this, comes, this goes back to the 50s, actually, where uh, machine learning was very experimental, and deep learning was invented maybe 50, 60 years ago. But it was so slow that nobody could use it. And there was so little data that it wasn't useful. Now, if you look at deep learning, it pushes the boundaries of any kind of uh, modeling technique, because these things improve and improve and improve as long as you feed it more data. It just lives on data. It eats data for breakfast, I assume. Uh, but then you can hit the, those error margins that make autonomous driving a reality, that make um, somewhat advertising a bit more targeted towards my needs rather than towards what the market wants to dump on me. Now, we're a bit of in a situation where a big companies kind of have a lot of data and a lot of users. And in Berlin and also here, we have a lot of startups doing excellent AI work. And there's only a few companies in the middle uh, that can do both and actually extract the value from that. 
So we were thinking, what if we try to <coughs> connect them or something in an open substrate uh, through something called a decentralized data exchange, which is not maybe only for finance or only for driving data, but maybe has a lot of shopping possibilities, but it's not managed by a single brand. Maybe it also should also include data that just belongs to the world and the commons. Maybe we want to create a bazaar with little markets where everybody can participate, everybody can open a little shop. But then the privacy of, of open data and exchange, well, you could do something like uh, use, a, use a blockchain ledger as access control layer. And maybe you can put some roles and permissions on that and you can have these public verifiable claims. Quite awesome. What if we have secure enclaves like cryptlets, uh, uh, Docker containers with security, uh, you have virtual uh, HSMs on pre premise computation. So this, what, what does this mean? This means that I have data and somebody wants to run a query or do some computation on it, I can accept his query, run it on my site, never leaves the data, uh, never leaves my security premise, and then I can give back the result, and I'm quite sure that they, my data didn't leak. And I'm also quite sure that that program that ran at my site is not harmful. Now we're rolling. Now, I get excited by something a bit more further out there. It's called either multi-party compute or full homomorphic encryption, where you can do encrypted queries over a pocket of encrypted data sets with different encryption keys. You can uh, do logic on encrypted data. Uh, you can prove without any knowledge that something happened. And, and that's really where your mind gets blown. Uh, so there is a path for it. And I, I, I'm working with a company that actually made a few things of this a factor 10 to the 20th faster. So it was infeasible in 2015, and now it's feasible in 2017. It's crazy. So these things become a reality. And I think that's also part of this community thing where, uh, yeah, just do it. Research becomes production in two weeks, no? Now, if you create a, any kind of data, public place or market or how you want to call it, there, there is always this problem of what's noise, what's signal, what's quality, what should go away. Um, one thing that we're experimenting with is curation, incentivized curation, having people trying to cast their opinion, and if they manage to predict what the global community feeling is, then they get a reward. Tokenized curation. So this is interesting because now I'm trying to predict something what everybody should be thinking. Maybe that decentralizes the reward function even more. So curation is an important thing. There's, this is actually quite booming on the Ethereum networks right now. So if you want to have your early entrance ticket in the Ethereum community, have a look. Um, so it's all building up to a protocol we call Ocean. It includes BigchainDB, but it also includes IOTA, Ethereum, whomever, uh, legacy uh, database vendors. And it really wants to create a protocol for a data availability market, a data curation market, a secure compute market, and bring all of them together in a single protocol. So a lot of work to do, but these things look emerging, the data markets are really popping up left and right, so why don't we create one single protocol that can connect them all? So I hope that was clear as a sugar cube. <laughs> 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 Dimitri, thank you.